This week on The Inside Story, false claims about immigrants threaten the fabric of a small Midwestern town, and a look at the forces threatening U.S. election integrity. Now, on The Inside Story, USA Votes 2024. Hi, I'm Jessica Dreep, VOA Press Freedom Editor. Welcome to the Inside Story. We begin with another dangerous moment in what has been an unprecedented election cycle. The FBI says that Donald Trump was the target of a second apparent assassination attempt. Here's Congressional Correspondent Catherine Gibson. President Joe Biden on Monday condemned what appeared to be a second assassination attempt against former President Donald Trump. In America, we resolve our difference peacefully at the ballot box, not at the end of a gun. The U.S. Secret Service had already come under congressional scrutiny for its handling of the July 13th assassination attempt on Trump. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson telling Fox News this second incident only increases the need for change. I think there are some, some really patriotic, uh, great people working in the Secret Service, but it's the leadership. We have no faith. Trump told Fox News Digital on Monday the Democrats' rhetoric was to blame. But Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer condemned the apparent assassination attempt Monday. There is no place in America for political violence of any kind. The suspect, Ryan Ruth, is accused of hiding in the bushes with a rifle outside Trump's Florida golf course. The 58-year-old activist is a strong supporter of Ukraine in its fight against Russia. He spoke with Newsweek Romania in 2022 about the war. This conflict is definitely black and white. This is about good versus evil. Russia said Monday the assassination attempt was a warning to the United States. Playing with fire has its consequences. Law enforcement officials told reporters the layers of security added in the days after the first assassination attempt helped protect Trump on Sunday. The system can work because the suspect didn't even get close to getting a round off and we apprehended him and brought him to justice. Ruth appeared in a Florida federal court Monday morning to answer weapons charges. Katherine Gibson, VOA News. During the presidential debate, candidate Trump falsely claimed that Haitian immigrants in Ohio are eating people's pets. Now, the small town of Springfield, Ohio, finds itself at the center of a controversy, manufactured for a fake news story. Obed Lamy and our Creole service traveled there. Here's what he found, as narrated by Elizabeth Chernoff. Haitian migrants living in Springfield, a small town in the Midwestern state of Ohio, are making headlines nationwide after being accused of eating residents' pets. The allegation, hosted on social media and amplified by the Republican vice presidential nominee, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, was repeated in last week's debate by former President Donald Trump, sparking outrage. Haitian migrants in Ohio, like Cleo, deny the allegations. I saw it on the internet. People talking about all Haitians are misbehaving. But definitely, there is no proof. Anyway, I don't walk around town. Although local authorities confirm there is no evidence of migrants eating pets, the rumor has prompted numerous bomb threats, forcing school closures, and is negatively affecting Haitians' lives in Springfield. Since we are Haitian, when news like that is published in the media, it scares us. We are just searching for a better life. Another Haitian migrant who spoke to VOA on the condition of anonymity for security reasons says an angry resident pulled a knife on him. I got a phone call and I step outside with a friend. We are just standing, and I saw a guy's truck. I wasn't even touching it. And he came out and asked, what are you doing? We said, we are just standing, and we are not leaning on your truck. The guy's truck, he posed like he was ready to fight. And his wife told us, just leave, go back inside. So we ignore him and left. But what really stunned me is the guy turned and said, you 
Asians. Then he pulled a knife on me. Springfield is a dynamic community with many positive attributes. It is disappointing that some of the narrative surrounding our city has been skewed by misinformation circulating on social media and further amplified by political rhetoric in the current highly charged presidential election cycle. The migrant issue is complicated. It goes beyond allegations of eating pets. There are more than 15,000 Haitian migrants living in Springfield, which has a total population of 60,000. Monte is a local resident who says the Haitian migrants are taking jobs from Americans. Jobs are getting took up, man. You know, all these, you say our factory needs 50 people. That could be 50 Americans that don't have a job. Instead, the Haitians, they take exactly all those 50 spots, man. So that's 50 people that don't have a job. Ernest is a customer service representative at Adasa Latin Market. He says over 70% of his customers are Haitian, and the influx of migrants has created some conflict with local residents. It's just a, a small town. People are narrow-minded in some areas. So I, I can see how they would feel that way. And it's also because people, like I said, like people don't know because of or the cultural differences, how do we cave? One migrant says he was threatened after moving to Springfield from Florida three months ago. Now he's thinking about packing up and leaving town. For VOA Creole in Springfield, Ohio, Elizabeth Cherneff, VOA News. When it comes to the comments that Republican vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance made about some female voters, calling them childless cat ladies, the senator is finding it hard to shake it off. When megastar Taylor Swift endorsed Kamala Harris and Tim Walls, she signed her statement, Childless Cat Lady. As US birth rates decline and more Americans choose not to have children, some say this could be the collapse of the economy and American society. Experts say it's not that simple. Tina Trin reports. Americans are having fewer babies. The fertility rate is at an all-time low, according to an April report by US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The issue entered the presidential campaign when a 2021 clip of Republican vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance resurfaced, saying Democrats prefer pets over children. We're effectively run in this country via the Democrats, via, via our corporate oligarchs, by a bunch of childless cat ladies. Who are miserable. Vance has called Democrats anti-family. If your society is not having enough children to replace itself, that is a profoundly dangerous and destabilizing thing. If you don't have children, you do not have a future. You cannot import the next generation. You've got to actually have stable, healthy, happy families. I think we should be aware that fertility rates have changed because they do fundamentally change our labor supply. They do ch put different types of stresses on our resources. Um, but whether or not we should raise that to alarm, uh, that's a different story. Shuba says fewer births could eventually mean fewer workers, which could strain the economy. But she adds, it's more complicated than that. It's never just the number of people in the workforce. It's how well those people, meaning their skills, their education, their stage of life, is a match for the demands in the labor market. Others note the question may be less about numbers and more about who is having babies. If you are saying that I'm very concerned about declining fertility rates, then you must acknowledge that those fertility rates are primarily among white women, meaning that your concern is really that white educated women are not having children. Meanwhile, CDC figures show U.S. populations with higher fertility rates tend to be people of color, who also tend to have higher maternal mortality rates. Still, overall, the rate of global population growth has been slowing for the last five decades. Globally, the total fertility rate or average number of children born per woman is around 2.2, uh, just barely above replacement level. And that just shows you that there are so many places in the world, in fact, two out of all, every three people in the world that um, live somewhere with below replacement fertility rate. Declining birth rates in the United States could be attributed to changing attitudes. A recent study from the Pew Research Center found that 47% of adults ages 18 to 49 say they're unlikely to ever have kids, and of those, 
57% say it's because they just don't want to. The childless cat lady moniker appears to be a badge of honor for some. Pop star Taylor Swift recently used it to sign off on her endorsement of U.S. presidential candidate Kamala Harris. Tina Trin, VOA News, New York. With the election day now close, America's adversaries are ramping up efforts to impact the outcome. National security correspondent Jeff Selden takes us through the array of sophisticated influence operations that target U.S. voters. In the U.S. presidential race, the push to win over voters is in full swing. We will save our economy. We will rescue our middle class. It's time to turn the page. Turn that page. But the competition, according to U.S. officials, has been joined by Russia. President Vladimir Putin's inner circle, including, including Sergei Kirinikov, directed Russian public relations companies to promote disinformation and state-sponsored narratives as part of a program to influence the 2024 U.S. presidential election. Part of the scheme, according to the U.S. indictment, included mimicking dozens of news websites to influence how U.S. voters think about critical issues. The other part involved Russia state-backed media outlet RT, charged with funneling almost $10 million to a U.S.-based media company. To pay unwitting Americans millions of dollars to carry the Kremlin's message to influence the U.S. elections and undermine democracy. Russia's denied the charges. This is Russiaphobia. This is an attack on freedom of speech. This is discrimination. And this is the dirtiest games of the U.S. and the deep state for manipulation during the electoral cycle. U.S. officials dismiss such denials as laughable. An unclassified intelligence assessment issued earlier this month calls Russia the most active foreign influence threat to the upcoming election, aiming to boost the chances of former President Donald Trump. And then there's Iran. We have observed increasingly aggressive Iranian activity during this election cycle. That includes recently reported activities by Iran to compromise former President Trump's campaign and to avoid an election outcome that it regards as against its interests. U.S. intelligence officials say China has also been running a small-scale social media campaign aimed at hurting candidates thought to be hostile to Beijing. But whether U.S. deterrence is working is questionable. I don't think so far this has really broken through as a top issue that most American voters are following, but it's really important for voters to understand what's going on and how they may be pawns. Giving Americans lots to think about as they get ready to head to the polls. Jeff Selden, VOA News, Washington. Miss and disinformation in elections globally is rife. My colleague, Christina Caseda smith spoke with the Senior Director of Media Relations at the News Literacy Project, Christina Vega. That's a non-profit organization that works to ensure that all students are skilled in news literacy before they graduate. They spoke about the role of media in separating fact from fiction on the campaign trail. What is the responsibility of the news organizations to fact check what each candidate says and why is it important? News organizations all have different ways that they deal with this, but fundamentally a credible news organization is dedicated to accuracy and to facts and to reporting things in a way that is not biased, that's as fair as possible. And so, you know, there might be different debates within the journalism community about how to handle um, statements made by candidates and that sort of thing. But ultimately, what you're looking for as a news consumer is that the news organization is dedicated to accurately informing you without um, trying to persuade you about anything um, about what's going on so that you can make your decision about voting on, based on facts um, and based on the things that are important to you. 
what are those steps that people can do to verify their information uh, and to make sure that what they're reading, you know, is being fact checked and is being, you know, sourced? There are things that we can all do to protect ourselves online. We can all make sure that we don't participate in sharing and spreading misinformation. You can do a quick fact check for yourself before you decide to believe something. Basically, a lot of the misinformation is designed just to be divisive and to really get you to feel a strong emotion. And so anytime that you're seeing a claim online that really taps into those feelings or seems really designed to um, drive wedges between people, that's a good, uh, a good time to pause and to think, is this really true, what I'm seeing? Part of the, the goal of people who are out there spreading this stuff is to make it harder for people to understand what to believe and to kind of give you get you to give up. And so you should not give up. Just a, a quick pause, a quick search can go a long way to helping make sure that you are informed and that your community and the people who you love around you are all informed, which is especially important in an election year when we're all going to vote. Do you think AI has made this work more difficult for journalists? You know, the speed which, you know, stories can be created, photos can be, you know, tampered. Has it make it more hard? AI definitely adds another layer of um, confusion and difficulty to trying to understand what's real or what's not. But the good news is that all of the same skills apply, whether you're a journalist or a news consumer. You know, when you see a claim online, checking multiple credible sources to see what they say about whether it's true, that's something that a journalist would do, and that's something that a news report, uh, a news consumer can do for themselves. Um, doing a quick search to see what the original source of an image is, uh, that can go a long way to helping you decide whether something's AI generated or not. It definitely requires more attention and effort from news uh, reporters and news consumers. But again, it's not a lost cause. It's not impossible. Um, it just might take a little extra diligence, uh, a little extra diligence um, for people to try to find out. The race for the White House remains tight, but Harris has opened a sizable lead over Trump among one group of voters, women. And they tend to vote at higher rates than men. As Thora McQuar reports, Harris's late entry into the race has only widened that gender gap. Since 1984, more women than men have voted in U.S. presidential elections. And, for the most part, more of them vote for Democrats than vote for Republicans. Vice President Kamala Harris's sudden entry into the race, following President Joe Biden's July withdrawal, appears to have fired up this voting bloc. We have seen a pretty significant shift um, across a lot of different demographics, but in with women in particular, who are now much more likely to vote for the Democrat at the top of the ticket than they were when it was Biden. This election year, roughly one in five women say abortion rights is their key issue. In 2022, Supreme Court justices nominated by then President Donald Trump helped eliminate constitutional rights to an abortion. Trump wants each state to decide abortion laws. Harris wants federal legislation to protect reproductive freedom nationwide. She's trying to create a world where um, people all have their rights to their own decisions, their bodies, their choices, women's rights. She's for the people, um, which is the middle class, which I am middle class, and the laws about women's rights. Among female voters, the latest polls suggest that Harris leads Trump by anywhere from 9 to 13 points. She gained a lot of younger women who independents, um, nonpartisan voters under the age of 50, many of them under 40, um, who really got excited by her candidacy. Black women are a lot more likely to vote for Harris now, Hispanic women. So, you know, as we have seen her do better with a lot of these um, specific racial demographics or um, educational demographics, we have seen with women that is really where that shift is coming from. Male voters favor Trump by anywhere from five to nine points, depending on the poll. First, her being the candidate uh, is kind of, it's really, this is like horrific to me because uh, first of all, She's not prepared to be president. For months, we would barely ever see Joe Biden. And all of a sudden, 
Kamala Harris is the uh, the nominee for the Democratic Party when she was never nominated in the first place. She came out of nowhere. The gender gap persists among young voters in Gen Z, where a majority of men under the age of 27 favor Trump, according to pollster David McLennan. There has been an increase in terms of the admiration of some Gen Z young men for you know, swagger. It's very much a, a macho punch him in the face kind of thing. McLennan says young men are politically socialized by online sources, where they often see and hear unflattering opinions about female leaders. So they believe that women can't make the tough decisions um, if the United States were to go to war or face an international crisis. They don't believe that women have the ability to be tough, make the tough call. White women were key to Trump's victory in 2016. He also won a majority of white women in 2020. In this race, the latest polls show Harris and Trump statistically tied among white women. Dora McQuar, VOA News, Washington. Disinformation is spreading through Spanish-speaking communities in the U.S., but a collaborative project is working to set the record straight. We return to Press Freedom reporter Christina Caseda-Smith for the story. From correcting myths and disinformation about immigrants to explaining how and where to vote, Hispanic news outlets in the U.S. have their work cut out for them. We are in an election year. People are searching for more information and asking more questions. When we post a story, we always get questions about it. Washington-based El Tiempo Latino reports on stories important to the U.S. Hispanic community and uses social media to reach their audience. Well, right now, all vertical content is very important, as well as short videos. I think that is the fastest and most efficient way to reach people. The Pew Research Center has found Latinos predominantly access news via the Internet and social media. And a Nielsen study says this community favors WhatsApp, Telegram and Instagram. Audiences want answers, says Ginestra. To provide audiences with the information they need, El Tiempo Latino uses fact-checking tools or enlists the help of its partner, Fact Chequeado. Founded in 2022, the nonprofit monitors mis- and disinformation in the news in the Latino and Hispanic community in the United States. Looking ahead to the November elections, Latinos have a lot of challenges, and those of us who seek to serve them and inform them also have challenges. One of those challenges is the use of artificial intelligence. For example, in videos on TikTok, we see that a video is published with a disinformation narrative, and then we see two other videos with the same narrative but with a different host, but saying exactly the same thing. Another challenge is keeping on top of all the disinformation. One narrative that appears a lot has to do with an almost conspiracy theory that claims that undocumented migrants are voting. Speed is key to debunking these false narratives, which travel quickly on social media, says Summer. But Factchequeado has a powerful tool at its disposal, collaboration. It has brought together dozens of partners in 22 states. Big and small newsrooms, like El Tiempo Latino in Washington, use factchequeado to verify information. Politics, without a doubt, is a topic where we see that Latinos or Hispanics are poorly informed or are misinformed. But we do see that our audience likes to read and learn. Part of the efforts to educate readers includes explainer videos about the U.S. electoral process. Otherwise, bad actors can take advantage and fill that void with disinformation, says Summer. Cristina Caicedo Smith, VOA News. Catch up on our past episodes at our free streaming service, VOA Plus. I'm Jessica Jury. We'll see you next week for the Inside Story. In times of change, when the world seems uncertain, and what we hear doesn't reflect what we see, we seek the truth. When we are told only part of the story, we lose trust. In moments of crisis, our dreams, hopes, and wishes for a better tomorrow depend on a free press. At Voice of America, 
We bring you the stories that people take risks to see. We connect the world and unite it with truth. At Voice of America, we show you the whole picture.